precious oceans in his hands. He made all creatures for his pleasure. And from the dust created man Who conceived imagination Whose justice is our cornerstone Who governs history just by speaking Calls the nations as his own. None like you, no other God. Our eyes are on you, immortal and throne. Jealously you love and keep us under the shadow of Good morning everyone, welcome to Church at Home. This is Yaku. I do again just want to welcome you to the service this morning. I trust that you will enjoy the worship, the service, some testimonies and everything with all of us. Just before we start, I want to ask that you get rid of any distractions, maybe put off your phone. And just pray and ask God to help you to focus on the message that you will receive this morning. Just a few announcements. We are really thankful for all the donations that are coming into our body surf accounts and also via the Relief Life Fund. We are still able to feed many families with food parcels or virtual vouchers. To give you an idea, it's about 10,000 rands worth of food parcels and vouchers that are going out per week. And we trust that we will be able to sustain it, but we also trust for many people to return back to work and to start earning an income again. Then we are having discussions around our church services and the reopening of services as a group of elders and leaders in our church here in Somerset West. We have decided not to open our services right now. We receive excellent guidance from our apostolic team and also had discussions with the headmaster of the WIP. But after considering everything, we decided we're not going to open right now. Also, the school are using all their venues for, for classes, and we are not allowed on the school grounds. We are only allowed to have services in the registered church buildings. All of that said, there's some excellent uh, videos made with feedback from Pastor Heinrich. That's available on our Facebook page. Also, a letter went out to all our church members this morning yesterday morning, actually. So I encourage you to go through that, read it, and please send us your feedback. We are going to engage with one another um, throughout this whole process. We take it week by week. Oh, there is the beeper going out. There's a team here getting ready for some cookies for hospitality after the service. Sorry about that. They are busy. They would like to have it ready as soon as we're done with our service. Let me just get out of the way here. Excellent. Great. So after the service this morning, we are going to have some of these cookies. We trust that it will be good. Lastly, I just want to say that all of us as leaders, um, the elders, I mean, have sorted out some permits 
to come and visit you. We don't want you to just be at home and to struggle all by yourself. We would love to, to pay you a visit. So please let us know if we can come and we would love to pray with you and just minister or just spend some time with you there in the presence of your home. And don't worry, we will have our mask on. We've got a list of regulations that we will have to keep. So we're really looking forward to maybe to see some of you out there. And for this morning, I pray that you will enjoy the worship with us. It's again James and, and a few others that's going to do the worship set for, uh, with us. Pastor Heinrich is going to share the word. And through all of this, we trust that you will be touched and experience God right there in your home this morning. And if there's any prayer requests or any feedback, please let us know. Contact any one of us and we would definitely get back to you. Amen. Hello everyone, so I'm super excited to actually firstly be wearing mascara today for the video, first time in 10 weeks, and I'm also excited to share a cool testimony with you. So um, in my work team we have a weekly update call, video call, um, and about two weeks ago on one of these um, teams meetings, I, like halfway through, experienced intense panic, anxiety all of a sudden and I felt like I'm going to just start screaming on the call and I was like, what is going on? Anyway, finished the call, carried on working, still experienced loads of anxiety and stress and a little while later, my colleague and very good friend Kerry phoned me about work and she said to me, Nastasha, this morning while we were on the um, meeting call, so strange, I feel I felt like this overwhelming feeling halfway through, and I just wanted to stop crying. And I was like, No way, I experienced the same thing. And then um, she said, Well, maybe we're experiencing something that someone else on our team is actually going through something. And I was like, Well, actually, on the video call, I, I distinctly noticed two of the ladies that we work with looked overwhelmed and like they were underlying things that was not like a and yeah, I noticed it while we were on the call and she said, me too, I also noticed two women. And we, we mentioned the names and it was the same two ladies and Kerry very cleverly said, well, let's each just phone them and yeah, how they're doing. And so um, I set up a call with the one and we ended up chatting like only two hours later, but um, I still experienced a lot of stress and I started just like getting up and I started just doing warfare and praying for her as the Holy Spirit led me. And then in our call, I just asked her if you like, you know, how she's settling into the new job and I don't know, I also just relational questions. And then I just quite honestly said to her like what happened in the morning and like why I'm actually calling her. And she's, you know, we experienced this issue, okay, and so on. And she just ended up sharing like some things that she's been going through in her personal health, in a family member's health, and just stuff in her home and in the, her husband's job, and just a few things that were really tough for her. And I asked her, Can I please pray with you? And she said, Yes. So I prayed over her. And yeah, afterwards we just carried on chatting and she stopped me and she's like, Nastasha, when you prayed for peace to be released over me, I experienced it and I experienced peace coming onto me and I experienced something lifting off of me that's been like heavy on me for a long time and I was like, wow, and I just wanted to stop crying because I was like, God just released peace over her and lifted burdens off of her like just on, yeah, he just led us and over a, a video. <laughs> yeah, so that was just incredible. Good morning everyone. I'm so excited to share a testimony um, of what happened this week at my workplace. But just for background, um, ever since I've surrendered my life to Christ in 2008, I've never had ex excitement for Pentecost like I did last weekend. Um, three weeks preceding Pentecost, I was just so excited for God to really do something and I was trusting Him for, for the Holy Spirit just to fill me with, with um, a boldness and power. I was really asking for that. So Nastasha and myself, we've actually set aside last week and just focusing on, on connecting with God and just making our requests known for, 
me to cost and it was an amazing experience. There wasn't like a measurable moment, but just last weekend was so cool in the presence of, of God and we were so stirred and excited. So coming to work, I came to work on Monday and um, one of my colleagues, I'm in construction, so um, we've been on the same project since 2016. And um, I've, I've had a word for him on my heart since 2018, but I've never had the boldness to actually share it. Um, and more than that is, in January he had an accident, we broke his arm while he was um, arm wrestling. So that's his, uh, his sport, his arm wrestling, he broke his arm. And, and there was plenty of times that I wanted to pray for him, but I didn't old enough to do it or I didn't take that step and then uh, um, but also throughout the years I've come to know that he gets uh, kidney stones quite often sometimes more than once a year he will get kidney stones and it's extremely painful I understand that it's extremely painful so yet again Monday I come to work and I hear he's in, a, he's in pain and we chat a bit and he's in pain and I was like and just for the first time I was like I can pray for him I can trust God to heal him like God is healed and I just asked him to come to my office and I, I shared with him, I prayed with someone before that got healed and I want to trust God to, to pray, to, to heal him and I pray for him because I see he's in pain. He's like, you know, so I prayed for him and I could release the word that I had in my heart for two years. I could pray for his arm that I wanted to do since January, but then I could pray for his kidney stone and the pain to go away. And then afterwards I asked him, is there any effect? And he's like, well, he doesn't feel pain right now. I was like, okay, that's cool. That's a good sign. And um, so he came back to me on Tuesday, and just like in the passing by, he was like, listen, Stephen, I, I, don't, I don't have any pain since you pray for me. And uh, he actually said he's very scared of me. I'm like, I find it extremely funny. Um, and I was overjoyed, and I, I even followed up with him on Saturday, and he still no pain. So God miraculously healed him. And I'm so excited because I believe God just wants my for all this to come upon me and God healed him and I'm so excited for the fact that I know we can I can engage with him um, about the things of God going forward and yeah it's just awesome testament so I want to encourage you to step out in this season and to trust God and make your request known to him. of our God and King Lift up your voice and with us sing Oh, praise Him Alleluia Thou burning sun with golden beam Thou silver moon with softer gleam
their creator bless and worship him in humbleness oh praise him alleluia praise praise the father praise the son and praise the spirit three in one
cry out with Jesus, oh Jesus, you're worthy, you're worthy, yes, Jesus, oh Jesus, you're worthy.
Hi, good morning everybody. It is amazing to be able to bring you this uh, Sunday message from the amazing Franschuk venue, the incredible church venue. We're so thankful to Pastor Richard and um, his leaders for allowing us the, the wonderful privilege to, to be here and to be able to do the sermon recording here. Today is really a collaborative effort. We have uh, many congregations joining us this morning. I hope that you enjoyed the worship that you had a wonderful time in the presence of God already. And I know that he would have been speaking to you as he always does through the worship. I want to encourage you to uh, write those words down that God has been laying on your heart during the time of worship. And the Holy Spirit might even have been speaking to you about a word for somebody else. Um, yeah, just follow through on that. Hey? Don't, don't delay. Follow through on that. Send that WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Uh, send the voice note, uh, make the call, and uh, let's continue to share the prophetic words as well that God lays on our heart. Let me pray for us. Uh, Father, thank you that we can be together this morning, Lord. We thank you for the tremendous privilege of your word that lives in our hearts and that we can still come together as believers, Lord, to encourage each other to know that we are bonded together around Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, the living Word who lives in our midst. And Father, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you will come this morning and Lord, long after the sound of my voice has faded away, that the sound of your voice will continue to minister to the hearts of your people. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for who you are in our lives. It is such a joy to know you. And I pray that you will have your way with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, this morning, I want to share with you guys a, a couple of thoughts and um, just a, a few highlights from, from my journey, just things that I have observed um, within our Shofar family, uh, a while ago I shared some of these thoughts with our pastors and the staff, and I thought it would be good for me just to share this with um, the rest of us as well as congregations and just as an encouragement to you. Um, you know, during this time, many things are changing, of course. I think we have all become used to the, to the new normal, the fact that uh, things are radically different to what we thought they would be at the beginning of the year. And um, things are slowly but surely beginning to return to some sense of normalcy. But there are still a whole lot of things that are unclear to us and a, and a whole lot of things that we know we have to get used to. Um, but what I've come to appreciate is the fact that even though so much is changing, and, and life is changing faster and at a more rapid pace than ever before, there are also a few things that are not changing. And I want to highlight that for us today, anchors that I have observed during this time. And the first one is a um, 
picture that I got from the book of Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah has always been very special to me. It speaks of a man who receives the calling from God to rebuild the broken down walls of Jerusalem. And so he goes to that city and together with uh, the rest of the nobles and the rest of the people, he begins to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And the walls, of course, were important because through the walls or by the walls or because of the walls, the city could live in peace. The city could function properly. They could do business in peace. They could have their families grow up in peace. And they could worship in peace. And so the walls were there for their protection for those on the inside. And the walls also kept the enemies out who were on the outside. And even though the book of Nehemiah is named after Nehemiah because he was such an incredible leader and played such an important role, the reality is that Nehemiah would never have been able to rebuild the wall had it not been for the people. And so in verse 6 of Nehemiah 4, this beautiful verse we find, it says that so we, I love this, so we built the wall. Not I built the wall, we built the wall. And the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. For the people had a mind to work. And we see here that even in the midst of tremendous opposition from so many of Israel's enemies, who were constantly bombarding them with fear and with intimidation and threats and manipulation and all of those things, that the people were able to start working on this wall. And they were able to build this wall up to half its height. And eventually, they were able to finish this wall. But what stood out for me about this was that the people had a mind to work. You know, one of the most challenging times during uh, this lockdown period, of course, has been to, to just see the desperation and to hear the desperation of, of many people as they, as they are not able to work, they're not able to um, give expression to the desire God has given all of us to be productive. And before the lockdown, it was bad. And now as the economy is coming out of that, people are slowly returning to work again. But there was this massive cry of desperation that was just rising in the hearts of so many people who want to work, who need to work in able to put food on the table, in able to give expression to their creativity and who God has made them to be. And I was wondering about this a little bit and remembering how often I would drive past men next to the side of the road and they would be so desperate. You could see the desperation in their eyes. They needed to work. And I began to realize that as strong and as overwhelming and as desperate as this economic desire for work is amongst the people of our nation, that there has been within the church a cry, a desire, an unction, a desperation almost, I want to say, within the hearts of God's people, they want to work. They want to put shoulder to the wheel. They want to be able to contribute and it has been amazing to see this happening. It has been amazing to see how the walls of our Jerusalem, of our, of our, our church family, is stronger than what it has ever been before. Why? Because of the people. You having a heart and a mind to work, to be part of ministry, not to wait for a pastor, not to wait for a ministry team leader, but to work, to rebuild the walls of relationship, to reach out to somebody else, to love someone, somebody else, to, to love sacrificially and to support one another. I've been so blessed by how people have been coming together why? Because this work is a work that we believe in. This work called the church of God is a work that all of us believe in and we have taken responsibility for this work. And This has been amazing to see. And I want to thank you for working with us and working with the Holy Spirit to rebuild the walls. Wherever you see there's a gap in the wall, wherever you see somebody suffering, whenever you see somebody drifting, whenever you see somebody hurting, then you are stepping up and you are reaching out without waiting 
for an instruction or for somebody to tell you what to do. And that has been so encouraging for me to see. What I've also seen was the fulfillment of Jeremiah 3, verse 14 to 15, where, where God speaks to His people and He says to His people, Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord. For I am married to you, and I will take you, one, from a city, and two, from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you shepherds according to my own heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And I will give you shepherds according to my heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And, and God is saying to His people that I am married to you. You are mine. You belong to me. And because you belong to me and because I love you so much, I am going to give you shepherds who love you. Shepherds who will, be, who will have your best interests at heart. And it has been such an overwhelming joy for me to see how the shepherds are standing up during this time. I've got the privilege of serving with incredible men and incredible women here in Somerset the West as elders and, and serving on a, on, a, on a bigger scale together with my other brothers and sisters within Shofar. Men and women who are laying their lives down for the sheep. People who are not doing this because it is a title, because they get a salary, because it is uh, something that is being held in high esteem. But no, people who are truly living, not as hirelings, but as shepherds, willing to follow in the footsteps of the great shepherd of the sheep who laid his life down. And people who are willing to go the extra mile. And it has been such an incredible joy to see how God is raising up these shepherds. And these shepherds are, are, are called pastors. They're called elders. Some of them are small group facilitators or ministry team leaders all throughout our church family. We see the spirit of shepherding that has come upon us. Where Jesus is shepherding his flock, but he's shepherding his flock through people. And, 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 and I want to encourage you to understand and to know that you are precious to us as an individual. I know right now that not all of us can meet together physically yet because maybe we don't have our own church building or maybe the risk is just too high at this present moment. But I want you to know that just because we are meeting online, you are precious. You are precious to us. You are precious to your pastors and to your elders. You matter to us. And we are so privileged to shepherd you. We are so privileged to be able to walk and to journey with you. And, and I want to say thank you to all of my fellow shepherds right throughout our church family for being willing to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. The third thing that I've observed, which has been a tremendous encouragement to my heart, is the reality that we have all known, but now we see this truly being fulfilled in our midst. Jesus, in Matthew 16, verse 18, he's speaking to Peter after Peter gets the revelation that Jesus isn't just a rabbi, he isn't just a good man doing good deeds, he is indeed the Son of God. And Jesus says to Peter, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. On this rock, on this rock of this revelation that I am the Son of God, that I have the power of life and death in my hands, that I am the Ancient of Days, that I am the Alpha and the Omega, that I am the bright morning star, upon this revelation I will build my church. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, praise God, lockdown or no lockdown, meeting in buildings or not meeting in buildings, we have never been stronger than at this moment because of Jesus. He hasn't changed. His power hasn't changed. His love hasn't changed. His provision hasn't changed. And therefore, we are not defeated. And so we don't act out of a sense of defeat. We act out of a place of victory and security because Jesus is building his church. So we're not just surviving. Hallelujah. It has been so heartwarming to see that the church, even in the area of our finances, God has done an incredible work. 
we've had during this lockdown period as a Shofar family um, across our, uh, uh, all of our churches. We've had some of the best months ever as, as, as people have just been just extravagantly generous. We have had the reach of our sermons spreading far and wide. We have had testimonies on Facebook and YouTube posted by, by, by members like you reaching more people than we would ever have been able to do before. Why? Because Jesus is building His church. He is enabling us to take the gospel to the poor. He is doing great things. There's deliverances taking place over Zoom. There are people's lives being transformed as we pray over Zoom and over WhatsApp and small groups coming together. And there's so much happening, not because of Zoom, not because of technology, but because Jesus is building his church. He built his church before technology. He's building his church with technology. And he will build his church even if technology were completely to be removed. Jesus is building his church. Not a man, not an institution, not an organization, not a structure. Jesus is building his church and you are part of this victorious church. The fourth thing that has been a tremendous encouragement to me is to see how God has, has made this, 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 this desire, this dream that He gave us about three years ago as we entered into this season within the history of us as a church family. In 2017, during our convergence, we started talking to one another about the reality that God wants us to be known, not for our amazing buildings, wants us to be known not for our incredible Bible school or our wonderful discipleship material that we have and the hundreds of mission teams that we are sending out. He doesn't want us to be known for any of those things. But as he says in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, that you are following me. When you have love one for another. The crazy context here is that Jesus Jesus has just washed the disciples' feet. He took his robe off, put a slave's um, apron around his waist, knelt down, washed the dirty feet of his disciples, showed them how to love one another, showed them that love has to be demonstrated, showed them that love cannot be something that you theorize about and something that you, that you just sing about. It has to be demonstrated. And Jesus, in the midst of, of his, his, one of his closest friends betraying him, in the midst of knowing that all of these men, except for John, whose feet he's washing now, will run away from him and leave him alone. He washes their feet. And man, I've been so blessed to see that, yeah, we're not being able to meet in all of our buildings now. And yeah, we're not able to do all the stuff that we were normally able to do. But the testimony is getting out there. It's getting into newspapers. It's getting into the social media. It's getting into the hearts of people that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm not just talking about Shofar, but the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is known for love. May we never revert back to our old ways when we're able to meet together again normally. May we never just settle for programs and settle for just going through the motions, but may His love continue to be driving us to love, to love extravagantly, to love courageously. And you know, so many of us, we have been tested on this love. And I believe that God came and God brought about even a purification of our love Cause us to understand that initially maybe we love each other for what we can get from one another or how we make one another feel. But there's a place where we move beyond the feelings. There's a place where we, we love when it hurts. We love when it's, when it's joyous and it's fun and we love when it's messy and painful. And when we move through that, then God can come and He can bless us with His resources. He has been blessing us with lately, as I mentioned, just hundreds of thousands of rands that God has just been pouring into our midst as we are just sharing that with the rest of our communities. And I believe it is just the beginning that God is going to entrust Riches to us, resources to us, 
as we continue to just say, God, we want to love you and we want to love those around us, that to him belong the cattle on a thousand hills. And if he knows that it's not about the riches for us, it's not about the buildings for us, it's not about those things, it is about loving one another, then he has a church that he can trust with the resources he wants to release to us. Have an expectation, church. Have an expectation wherever you are, whatever your location is, that if we continue to love each other passionately, courageously, consistently, God will fulfill His part of the deal. His part of the deal is to build the church. Our part of the deal is to love one another. And so I want you to be encouraged. And I want to say thank you that you are part of the people of God that are building. I want to say thank you for receiving the spirit of shepherding and helping us to shepherd one another. I want to say to you, continue to put your trust in the one that's building the church. And I want to say thank you for just showcasing the love of God to those around you. Psalm 52, I want to spend a few minutes on Psalm 52 for us in, in, in just wrapping this all up. Psalm 52 was written by David. He was about 20 years old at the stage when he writes the psalm. And it, it is birthed out of a tremendous betrayal which David experienced. And he, he was betrayed by this guy called Doeg. He was an Edomite, one of Saul's servants. And, and, and David runs from Saul. Saul has just been filled with so much rage and jealousy. And so whenever David plays on his harp and, 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 and Saul um, sense of peace comes upon him. But as soon as David stops playing, he's overwhelmed by this jealousy towards David and he wants to kill David. And so David runs away. David tries to get away from Saul as far as he can. And then he ends up in this village called Nob. It is where the priests lived and was where the tabernacle was at that stage. And David goes into the tabernacle. He lies, unfortunately, to the, to the priest there. And he says, but... Um, Saul knows that I'm here. Saul has sent me on a mission. The priest helps David, gives him some of the showbread, gives him Goliath's sword. But just as David leaves, one of Saul's servants happened to be there as well. Sees David, goes to Saul, tells Saul that David was in the village of Nob, and Ahimelech, the priest, aided David. Saul comes in an absolute fit of rage. He kills, in actual fact, he calls uh, a Doeg to kill the priest. None of the other servants of Saul wanted to do it, but this guy Doeg comes. He kills, I think, 85 of these priests. Saul then wipes out the entire village of priests. Men, women, babies, oxen, donkeys, everybody and everything killed. Can you imagine how far Saul had fallen? And David, David writes this psalm. All right? He writes this psalm when he hears this news one of Ahimelech's sons escapes, and he comes to David, and he says to David what has happened. And David writes this and says, Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The goodness of God endures continually. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully. You love evil more than good, lying rather than speaking righteousness. You love all devouring words, you deceitful tongue. But God shall likewise destroy you forever. He shall take you away and pluck you out of your dwelling place and uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, Here is the man who did not make God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. And I want you to notice something here. David comes and David says, Man, I cannot believe this. I cannot believe that this has happened. I cannot believe, Doeg, that you were so cruel and that you, that you could betray me and that you could do this boasting in your evil. Do you have no respect for God? Do you have no common decency? How, how can it be that you push your selfish agenda to betray me simply to score points with Saul? He says, why do you boast in evil? You know, at one stage, David says to to, to uh, Himalek's son, he says to him, man, I've done this. This is my fault. I should never have been there. It's my fault that your father and the entire family and, 
and relatives and all the other priests were killed. And, and so David comes with this question, probably, you know, just feeling guilty in himself and, and just in this, this absolute lack of comprehension. How could you do this? Derek, how could you do this? And you know, there's so much happening around us beyond our control. There's so many people doing things, having an influence over our lives. You know, just this past week, our kids going to school, then they're going to school, then they're not going to school. You know, we're here in the Western Cape, some of you guys in other parts of the country, your schools probably haven't opened up yet. Then you can do this, then you can't do that. And there's so much that is happening all around us. So many things that are beyond our understanding and our comprehension even. But look what David does. He says, the goodness of God endures continually. He roots himself within the goodness of God. He roots himself within the goodness of God. He roots himself within the goodness of God in spite of everything happening around him. And, and how do you do that? How do you root yourself in God's goodness? How do you stay planted in God's goodness during times of change, during times of, of upheaval, during times of uncertainty as we find ourselves in? I want, to, I want to unpack this a little bit around four I statements. Right? The first one we see there in verse 8. David says, but I, but, again, I love that, but, but I am like a green olive tree. So first, there's, there's the man that delights in evil, the man that trusts in his own riches, the man that doesn't rely upon God, that doesn't acknowledge God. But then he says, but I am. The, the but is an outflow of faith. Remember that Jesus said that when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith upon the face of the earth? The but is always an outflow of faith. Yes, this is happening, but I am choosing a different perspective. I'm choosing to look through the eyes of my heart and not the eyes of the natural. It says, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. The first thing I want you to notice there is says that I am. It doesn't say that I do. I am. Before we start engaging and we are having to become productive and we're having to lead our families well and lead the church well and lead our businesses well and make a difference in the community, before all of those things become priorities for us, let's remember that we are first and foremost I am's. You are an I am, I am an I am. English teachers, try and figure that one out. We are I am's. We are I am's, not I do's. We are I am's. Why? Because first and foremost, it is about our identity. And David says, man, I'm like the green olive tree. All right, and the olive tree speaks about just peace, speaks about uh, prosperity, speaks about vitality in the midst of the desert. In the midst of very harsh circumstances, the olive tree survives. The olive tree is, is, is able to, to flourish when other things crumble and die around it. But the olive tree also reminds us of the anointing, reminds us of the fact that that olive needs to be crushed so the olive oil can flow. And so David understands as well that I am God's son. I am God's daughter. I am loved by God. I am more than an overcomer through Christ who loves me. I am who God says I am. But I understand that even as I am secure in Him, I'm also vulnerable within Him. And I know that in order for me to have the anointing flow through my life, I need to submit to Him. Saints, submit to what God is busy with in your life. And if you are in a crushing, if you are in a, in, a, in a place now when the I do's have been stripped away and you're struggling to reorientate yourself, maybe it's a good question just to ask yourself or to ask the Holy Spirit rather, Holy Spirit, show me who am I. And from time to time we have to revisit that. Who am I? Who am I when I cannot stand in front of the church and preach? Who am I when my business isn't being able to expand the way that I thought I would? Who am I when I cannot play in the, in the rugby tournament? Who am I when I cannot do what I thought I needed to do in order to feel secure about myself? I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I'm rooted in the presence of God. 
the house of God speaks about God's presence, not the building, but God's presence. And I'm rooted in the community of God. And within that community and within His presence, I flourish. I am. Secondly, there He says that I trust. He says, I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. Remember the evil man. Remember the man of the world. He trusts in his riches. He doesn't trust in God. But David says, I trust in the mercy of God. I don't trust my projections. I don't trust the stock exchange. I don't trust the newspapers. I don't trust all the things that maybe I relied upon before. I trust in the mercy of God. You know, because David, David had the sense as well of guilt because he, he lied for, for fear of his life. He lied and there were some, some, some very unpleasant consequences because of his lying. But he came back to God and says, God, I'm trusting in your mercy. I'm trusting in your mercy. As we begin to reintegrate into society, let us refuse to put our trust in anything else except the mercy of God. The mercy of God, the, the blood of Jesus that has given us access into his presence. Um, oh, his mercies are new upon us every day. If you have come to the end of your strength, if you have come to the end of what you could do in your own natural ability, find your confidence, find your hope. I want to say even find your boldness. I sense that there are quite a few of us that our boldness has taken a knock because of things that have been stripped away from us and we feel vulnerable, we feel insecure, we feel unable to engage with God or with our community around us with boldness because we don't have a track record now of things that we can look back on. I want to say to you, find your boldness, find your confidence, find your trust in the mercy of God. Find it in the mercy of God that will not change. Because David says here, I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever and ever. Amen. Pre-lockdown, during lockdown, post-lockdown, doesn't matter what comes. We put our mercy, our trust in God's mercy. And then he says, I will praise. I am, I trust, and I will praise I will praise you forever because you have done it. One of the ways in which we stay rooted in the goodness of God, one of the ways in which we remind ourselves that God is good is by engaging in praise. David says, I will praise. We understand that, that, that worship is, is much more than songs. Worship is a lifestyle where everything that we do flows out of a heart of worship and is consecrated and lifted up to God and say, God, I'm doing my schoolwork is worship unto you. God, I'm writing this, this article for the newspaper is worship up to you. God, I am I'm engaging with my board meeting is worship up to you. Be glorified through this. But praise has another element attached to it. Praise is demonstrative. Praise is engaging. Praise is involving all of my faculties in saying it. I will praise. And saints, I pray to God that when we are able to gather together again, and we're all able to sing with one voice, we're all able to lift our hands and clap our, our hands and jump and kneel and, 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 and express our praise and our love and our longing for God, that our praise muscles would not have grown weaker. Amen. May there be a mighty shout. May there be an earth-shattering, building-shaking shout when we come together again because that shout has been birthed and has been exercised and has been trained in secret now in the closet, in the inner room, at home, when the band isn't there all around us. We are engaging with God. We are lifting our hands. We are clapping our hands. I want to encourage you to go and make a study of praise and you will see that almost always it is demonstrative. Almost always there is an engagement that happens. And David here says, I will praise you because you have done it. Oh, hallelujah. David was about, like I said, 20 years old here. It would be another 10 years before he would be crowned king. And David says, through the eyes of praise, I see things right now that nobody else can see. Through the eyes of praise and through the mouth of praise, I'm responding to God as if He has already done it. God, You are my source. 
And I praise you not just for what you have done. And I praise you not even just for what you will do, but I praise you also for who you are. You have done it. You have saved me. You have redeemed me. You have rescued me. I will praise you. There's this beautiful song, and I'm almost done. Miracles by, by Jesus' culture. And then the chorus says, I believe in you. I believe in you, the God of miracles. I believe in you. I believe in you, the God of miracles. The one who does impossible is reaching out to make me whole. Reaching out to make me whole. The one who put death in its place. His life is flowing through my veins. His life is flowing through my veins. About two weeks ago, I, I for the first time read the story of the song. And this, this song, this, this, this guy who wrote these words, the one who put death in its place, his life is flowing through my veins, had just lost his baby. And so in that moment, he comes and he writes this song through the eyes of praise. And he says, you are the one that put death in its place. You have overcome death and there will be a day when I will see this child again. I praise you. Now the song is stirring faith in the hearts of so many. The one who put death in its place, his life is flowing through my veins. Amen. Praise him like never before. And then we are rooted and anchored in God's goodness by understanding that we are who he says we are. Right? I am. And I trust in his mercy, and I will praise him, and I will wait. David says, I will wait on your name, for it is good. I will wait on your name. And man, you know, some of the most beautiful moments that I've experienced is, is, is doing weddings and just standing there with a bridegroom. Uh, I recently did a wedding. It was the most intimate, this, the smallest, but probably one of the most special moments just with a couple Jan Sarl in the arena there in, in, um, in Summers of the West. And just about 10 people present at the wedding. And, you know, whether it was that wedding or the wedding before where Jean Ray and Emma got married, and, and there I think were about 80 people just before the lockdown, or other weddings where there were more people. You know, the bridegroom responds in the same way. He's waiting for his bride. And he's waiting for his bride and chatting with the groomsmen, chatting with family. And then someone says, Emma is here. Narina is here, and something happens to their bridegroom's heart. Something happens to him. You, you can see there's a stirring inside of him, and he, he maybe made promises to himself about, you know, he's going to be in control, and he's not going to cry, and he just cannot help him because at the mention of her name, something happens to his heart because he's been waiting for her. Oh, saints, may we wait for the name of Jesus more. May we wait on the name of Jesus more than what any government could declare, what any person could say. May we wait on his name. May we wait on his name with expectation to understand that the name of Jesus carries everything that we need. May his name stir our hearts. May his name bring forth praise from our lips. May his name encourage us to put our trust in him. And may his name encourage us to let go of every false identity and be lost in Jesus. May he continue to be the name above all names in our lives, higher than coronavirus, higher than the, than the tension that is spilling over from the world and wanting to disrupt everything. May the name of Jesus cause our souls to wait on him. And may we be constantly rooted in his endearing goodness. Let me pray for us. Father, I want to pray. Lord, for my brothers and my sisters listening to the sound of my voice, God, or watching this recording, I pray, Lord, that you will meet them where they are at. Father, I pray that you will stir their hearts, Lord, to, to, to let go of every false identity, anything that will want to come and sit upon them, Lord, and lie to them about who they are. God, may they just continue to shake that off. I thank you, Lord, that we can put our trust in your mercy. Thank you for everything that has been shaken right now, God, even in our lives. We thank you for reorientation, to trust in your mercy. We thank you, Lord God, for songs of praise erupting.
We thank you that we are going into a season, a lot of tremendous praise rising up and strongholds that are coming down as we are praising you. And thank you that we can wait on your name for it is good. It is beautiful. The name of Jesus. Still the name above every name. And thank you that you have put your name upon our hearts. And we are called by your name, Jesus. We are called by your name. And Lord, we receive everything that your name holds for us. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. If you have any prayer needs, engage with your local leadership where you are at. Send us an email. Guys, Ian Shofar Somerset West. We would love to pray with you. If the sermon has touched you in any way, please reach out to us. And we would love to spend some more time even coming to visit you. For those of you who cannot meet together at this present moment, know that all of us as elders and pastors, we've got permission to get to you. We'd love to come and visit you and bless you where you're at at home. Thank you for spending this time with us. Enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you for being part of this amazing church family that God has given us. The Lord bless you. Bye-bye. Sorry.